what an attorney is. Jerry Angus was born January 28, 1918, in Sheridan, Wyoming. He died August 26, 2007, at the age of 89. He served in the Army during World War II. He gained international fame as an inventor of magic and as a close-up magician. The Society of American Magicians presented Jerry with a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2007. He founded Mysticians, a magic club in Eugene, in 1962. He was a member of the Society of American Magicians, the International Brotherhood of Magicians, the Magic Castle in Hollywood, California, Corvallis Secular Society, Oregonians for Rationality, and Albany Writers Network. He is survived by his brother, George Andrus of Albany. Chairman of Jerry's um, remains uh, in um, Jefferson, Oregon. The unbridled fires of time advanced with fury, creating and occupying space, filling it with the fertile germs of life, far-reaching and incomprehensible islands of matter are formed with glowing embers surrounded by cooling offspring. On one of these children of fire lived a being called man who wondered at the lights which shone overhead. And he wondered what could he do with things about him to show his fellow man. His name was Jerry Andrus, and his forte was making things appear as they were not. He was a man of great honesty, an inspiring influence on others, endowed to the fullest with mental and physical creativity. As the world has given him life, so we do this day return him to the world as his spirit bears on. And then we lower his remains into the grave at that point. This on a somewhat lighter vein. On January 28, 1918, there came about with doubt, without a doubt, a man of great esteem. His mother named him Gerald. His hands went to his ears. He's better known as Jerry throughout his shining years. Master of the playing card, designer of the pen, performing always with regard. One of a kind he has been. When you think illusions, Jerry was the name. He always had a new one every time you came. <laughs> one thing I remember, one thought that memory brings, the marvels he created from simple little things. Jerry and George have, have been, to me, uh, uncle-like friends. We do anything, and over the years, uh, Jerry and I, we did a lot of those anythings. Um, we shared uh, a lot of joys. This is living. This is living. That's what Jerry would say. He would say it when the times were good, and he would say, this is living. <laughs> when, when the times were bad, he shared what a gift living was all of my relationship with him. And I often wondered where it all came from. Uh, in February, Jerry found out he had terminal cancer. And his last wish of me was to help him digitize his, as he would say, accomplishments. And get his accomplishments online <coughs> so that he could inspire you and your children to come into the future. He, it was okay with him to be uh, dead at the time, just not the gone part. 
So it's up to you to make sure that he's not gone. Uh, to participate, to use his name, to use his ideas, to perpetuate his spirit. And then he'll never be gone. <coughs> he'll always be in our hearts. Um, two days before uh, Jerry went into the um, Mennonite place that he eventually died in, uh, we listened to the piece I'm going to play, the second piece I'm going to play for you, and uh, he agreed that this is the piece that we should play at my memorial. It's done in 1968. I found a piece to kind of explain it that I'm going to cut first. But you have to understand that Jerry went, and I, and I got to experience it from digitizing in over three or 400 hours of audio tapes. Remember when he had the tape recorders? Well, I, I got them all. And um, of all of that stuff, I watched him go from a man who wanted to believe in God, who researched it in a logical, rational way, to a man that was skeptical, to a man that was a non-believer, and to finally... This is Jerry Andrus. Welcome to my own website. The following material on this tape is all of my own creation. Some recorded so many years ago I had forgotten all about it. While I am an agnostic, several of the things are about God, as if he did exist. Some praise him and some blame him. All of the voice and sound effects are my own. Some of the material may be totally boring to you, but I hope you will find some of them of interest. I've been asked uh, what a good death would be from my perspective. Well, in my case, since I'm an agnostic, I think I'll be dead and gone. A good death for me would be that if some of the things I've left behind have a good influence on people and tend to leave the world a better place than I found it. He told me, let's see, I forget how far back I was terminal going down day to get things straight down and find out, and get a rough idea of how long and before I kicked the bucket. A friend of mine was a cartoonist, and he made this for me. Wow. I have, I have an ad for nicotine cigarettes. And the, uh, extra tire and extra nicotine. And uh, the guy, the, the announcer giving the ad is, is telling the wonder of nicotine cigarettes. Then he starts coughing. <coughs> Then the other announcer comes on and says, I'm sorry, the announcers come down with a cold. Hello, friends, who wants a cigarette without any tars and nicotines? Ladies and gentlemen, announcing a tremendous breakthrough in the petroleum industry. Listen to me, ladies. This is exotic face lotion. Now, about what did you have in mind in the way of an automobile, sir? Would you like a fast back with four on the floor? Each of us possesses a brain that could conceivably be the most unique thing in all of the universe. And what do we do with it? Most of us let it lie there and rot. We don't seem to want it stirred up to where we wonder, who am I and what are my possibilities? We don't seem to want to realize that we are a unique part of the wonder of life. We don't want our brain mobilized. We want it tranquilized. Entertain me, we say, as we take the priceless glistening hours and squander them there in front of the platitudinous boob tube. We sit there, it seems, like a vegetable, and let the electron beam of the cathode ray tube help our brain to atrophy, petrify, and ossify. And we call ourselves a man, and let the dancing electron beam play its tune of vicarious living on the cells of our soul. The probing beam doesn't stir our brain and say, wake up and live. It merely probes it and pokes it, and it says, laugh, or it says, cry. And above all, it pleads with the mind of man to lie still. Let me probe you and poke you until you laugh and cry. And make your hours slip by. And then one day, you die. Don't let me shake you and scold you and say, wake up and live. What will you leave in the world behind? A spot where you sat and looked with a stare 
at the picture there. Did you stand in the sun and shout to the sky, here am I? May I laugh and love and even cry, but here am I? What will you leave in the world behind? A spot where you sat and looked with a stare at the picture there. This is a monologue that I wrote uh, 9th of February, 1968. Rather, I put it down on, thought of and put it on my little tape recorder when I was going from Newport to Albany. I'm trying to play the organ, turn the pages, uh, watch the VU meter, and uh, read the text all at the same time, so there'll probably be a lot of imperfections in this. Once I had a dream that I stood in the sacred halls of time, and before me there were three doors, and above one door was inscribed the words, This is heaven, and above another, This is hell, and above the third door was written, He who enters here may go through hell to paradise. And I turned to the door of heaven, and I would lift the latch, but my hand would not move, for this was a dream, and in that dream, I turned to the door, labeled, He who enters here may go through hell to paradise. Though I fought against my arm, it lifted my hand to the latch, and a chill crept through my soul as I heard the ominous click. And though I would not have it so, I drew open the door, and there was darkness, a formless blackness that I could not describe. It was shapeless, yet a boiling blackness. I could see nothing there, yet everything, a whirling vortex that grasped the tangled strands of my brain and drew me forward into the darkness. I was drawn into this churning maelstrom of the night like a moth into a flame, and it closed its dark fingers around me and drew me into a blackness I never had known. There was no day, and there was no night, and there was only blackness only blackness and then there was terror stark blind terror that thrust in its icy claws and my soul screamed its silence into the silence beyond and i knew now that this was hell hell was not fire nor fervent heat nor was it the grinning glee of an evil satan hell was blackness that says to your soul, you can have no light, you can have no sound, you cannot see the sun nor the sky, nor can you die. Your life is blackness, and it shall ever be. And so I knew that hell was not a fervent heat, nor was there a devil there to taunt my soul. Hell was an utter absence of everything, a feeling of light and of sound and of touch, there in the intolerable blackness. My soul cried for a speck of light, even one tiny star that would make a pinpoint in the dark. Oh, but for a simple sound that my ears could hear, a touch, a whisper, a spark of light, why had I not known them when they were mine? Oh, if only life were mine again, I would bend down to the grass and feel its softness on my face. I would look to the sun and glory in its warmth, and each and every sound that I ever heard would be like golden bells of heaven. The whispering wind through the trees would be a symphony that sang in my soul, and the touch of a friendly hand I would treasure like a miser's gold. I would hear each sound, each whisper, glory in the green of each blade of grass. Oh, if I could only touch again the life I had known and let slip through my fingers, until here I am in the depths of darkness, and there is no dawn, there is no sun, there is no sound, there is no dawn. But then there came through the darkness a far-off whisper of sound, and it swept through my soul like the bells of heaven. I cried in ecstasy as it played on the strings of my heart. And then there was a tiny spark far off in the infinite blackness, and the sound that now played a symphony in my soul swept me through the dark toward the spark that I knew was dawn, and I swept on toward the light into the reaches of the universe and on through the stars until they spun past me like meteors in the sky at the point of light that had drawn me out of the blackness. 
now became a form, the most beautiful thing my eye had ever beheld. It was an emerald sphere that turned in the sky, and it was earth, and I swept on with a cry of joy until I stood in a meadow and looked up at the sun and the birds and the trees. I fell to the ground and buried my face in the grass, and my soul shed its tears of joy. And then I knew that I had come through hell to paradise. And when I wakened from the dream, it was still with me, crystal clear as if it had been real. I went out into the morning air and breathed it into my lungs, and it soaked into me like the nectar of life. And I bent down to touch the grass and stroke its greenness with my hand. The tiny jewels of dew sent a cool tingle through my fingers. I raised them to my lips, and it was like the touch of heaven. Footsteps on the walk, a stranger passing by. I stepped out to meet him and spoke, good morning. And he replied the same. I extended my hand and he took it, and I grasped his own between mine. And I said, wonderful morning, wonderful morning. And I could see as he went on his way that he wondered why. Why had a total stranger spoken to him thus? For he did not know that I had come through hell to paradise. For he did not know that here was heaven, here on the green paradise of earth, where each birth is a miracle and each breath is a breath of life. Here is the garden of the sun, where grows the grass and the birds and the trees. Here is the garden of the sun, where man walks erect, and the reaches of his mind are even beyond his own comprehension. Here is the garden of the sun, and with each breath I draw, until my very last, I shall always be aware that I have lived in paradise. Perhaps because 
because it doesn't deserve to have too many of you at any one time. I see you curmudging you. The world doesn't deserve too many. Hmm. Your exact model, I regret to say, has been discontinued. I, perhaps I should say we, will never forget you, and it's signed by James Randi, September 1st. Um, <clears throat> this is, I'm gonna read you a few paragraphs from the actual article that appeared in this. These photographs were taken in July of 80. This article appeared in the May 81 AMI at the UC Copy. Magic begins when we ring his doorbell. A cascade of electronic beeps echoes from within. The house is large, dark, and gabled, and sits on a quiet corner lot on a small town of Albany, Oregon. The man inside is a magician's magician, a wizard of, of wizards, two wizards. The great Blackstone called his close-up magic the best I've ever seen. Die Vernon says this man is the most original magician in the world. Martin Gardner calls him the one man in the country who is most capable of fooling a professional magician. The door opens to another electronic riff and there stands Jerry Andrews, six feet tall, curly gray hair, a rugged face, square jaw, welcoming smile. He looks much younger than he is, 63 years. <coughs> Welcome to the Castle of Chaos, he announces. Before we go in, there's something in the yard I want you to show you. I built it just for your visit. Come on, the lights should be just about right now. We walk around the house to a large open lawn, and there, about 100 feet away, is a carpenter's nightmare. <laughs> Why does a grown man spend time constructing such an assault on this census? Well, said Andrews, and none plus by the question, I figured out how to do it. Nobody else has ever done it. At least not with a straight, uncut board. I'm interested in how the mind works, and I'm interested in how it illusion. That's why I create illusion. That's why I do magic. Besides, when other magicians see this picture, they'll run crazy. <laughs> and just loves to drive other magicians crazy. He's famous for it. Early in his career, Jerry Andrews decided to perform only illusions that he himself had created. He avoids reading magic books so he will not be contaminated by learning the usual way that tricks are done. Using none of the traditional sleight of hand maneuvers, he invents new ways to control and conceal objects. For example, and he scrupulously avoids the one central principle of most magic misdirection in that getting a spectator to look in one place while the magician is doing something else. The effect of misdirection, Harry feels, is. If you realize your attention has been drawn away at a critical moment, you don't know, you don't know how a trick was done, but you think you caught the moment. Quote, I want people to rivet their eyes on my hands, Peter says. If they look away, even for an instant, the miracle is lost, as far as I'm concerned, because in a layman's mind, the hand is still quicker than the eye. Well, if people see the magician cut and shuffle the deck before revealing the chosen card, they'll think, oh, he just shuffled the card to the top so fast I couldn't see it. I don't want my audience to even entertain the hypothesis that they were misdirected. That's not a miracle. Nobody else invents magic tricks the way Anders does, says Ray Hyman, University of Oregon psychology professor. I was an accomplished magician in his own right. <coughs> Let me move on to cast some things that Ray is going to say. Milbert Christopher, the past national president of the Society of American Magicians, said, Jerry Andrews lived in a small town where he didn't have contact with major magicians. He didn't know that traditional ways affect our work. He had to make up his own way of doing tricks. Consequently, when he performed, he astonished everyone, including the experts. When acquaintances talk about Jerry Andrews, the characteristic they mention most, after his originality and his inventiveness, is his extraordinary moral Sense. Andrews's honesty in this day and age, back in 81, can only be called eccentric. A few years back, um, let me, oh, he quit his job and uh, Jerry's uh, raising his type about that. He thought it was dishonest to stay at a job that was wanted more money for less work, so he quit. He thought this was honest. When he was 
He resigned. When he, Anders was in New York City, we walked with him to a restaurant across town. We crossed streets only when the sign said, walk. When they said, don't walk, we waited on the curb with him alone. <laughs> <laughs> Anders is compulsively honest in his manner, too. In one trip, after you've chosen your card, Anders takes a card from the deck and under the table, places it inside the card box, then takes it right back out and replaces it in the deck. At the end of the trick, he'll open the box and pretend to take your card out of it. Why the unnecessary move? It's so that he can honestly say while he's doing it, I am now putting a card in the box. <laughs> and say it convincingly without covering a lie. The ultimate illustration of Anderson's honesty is a story told by Di Vernon, magician in residence at Hollywood's Magic Castle. It seems the magician, magician was sawing a woman in half, using the old routine in which two women are used, one for the head and one for the feet. Then one of the women fell sick. So the magician hired a boy to hide in the box and stick his feet out at the appropriate moment. Quote, on stage, Diver said, he saw the box, he sawed the box, separated the halves, and being compulsively honest, like Jerry Andrews, he said, behold, on this side you see your head, and on this side you see his feet. <laughs> <laughs> sense colors the way he treats his audiences. He makes <coughs> them to feel fool but never foolish. He never makes himself out to be superior. That's unusual too, says Frank Hyman. Many a magician get a charge out of the feeling of power, one up and share. Terry's always telling his audiences the only reason he can fool them is that they are as intelligent as he is. Andrews elaborated, quote, you know children are notoriously hard to fool because they don't take many things for granted to a child might dissolve. They might be in two places at once. They don't know what can't be done. The smarter and the more intelligent you are, the more, more easily you can be fooled because you have more to work with. Hyman teaches classes in cognitive psychology at the University of Oregon. Andrus is a frequent guest lecturer there. Well, Jerry's philosophy of magic fits right in with contemporary theories about how the mind works. In fact, he has anticipated current psychological thinking by about 10 years, Hyman says. Traditionally, there was the assumption that when people are fooled, it's because there's been some breakdown in normal functioning, some deficiency or abnormality that needs correcting. We're coming around to the idea, which Jerry has held all along, people are fooled precisely because their senses are working as they should. The mind has to cut corners and fill in blanks. If it didn't do that, it wouldn't be much of a mind. There's nothing in the world that we see that we don't contribute to by evaluating it in the light of our past experiences. This notion that errors in perception are not the mind's shortcoming, but in fact are evidence that the mind is working exactly as it should, is right at the forefront of contemporary psychology. The mental processes that make us the great cognitive achievers we are, are the same processes that make us vulnerable to Jerry's magic. The only way to be safe from being full as at a price you wouldn't want to pay, it would be to cease to believe anyone, anything, even yourself, not make any conclusions at all, not do anything. The idea that the capacity to make mistakes is a sign of superior kind of development is not just the latest fashion in psychological theory. Oliver Selfridge, the computer scientist at the University of Massachusetts, has said, quote, my goal in life as a scientist is to create a program that is sufficiently intelligent that it can be fooled. Historically, magicians, this is my minute in my last paragraph here, historically, magicians have among, among the first to make use of new technology before the technology becomes widely known, electromagnetic magnets, mirrors, hydraulic lifts, electronic signaling devices, miniature radios, even one that's small enough to be embedded in a tooth. All were used by magicians and spiritualists to work their wonders before these devices became widely known to the public. But pure magic, the magic that looks like a real miracle, Andrus style, is in a strange way antithetical to the new technology. As society becomes more technologically sophisticated, we as an audience become more suspicious and harder to please. Any trick that hints of a possible gadgetry becomes suspect. What will happen, quote, when we get a three-dimensional color hologram that you can't tell from the real thing? 
Anders wondered. If a magician produces a girl from the box, he'll have to prove each time it's a real girl and not a hologram. In a few years, if I give you a deck of cards and have you go over to the corner and name them as you look at them, he'll just say, oh, you got one of those microtransmitter wafers in each card and you got a receiver in on you. Once you know a trick could be done with microprocessor, fiber optics, or labor, the trick becomes suspect even if you don't use the technology. Jerry Anderson's style may be the future of magic. There are no machines, no gimmicks, no fancy apparatus to make you suspicious. <coughs> you bring them into your own, you, you bring in your own deck of cards, you sit close, you watch carefully, you aren't diverted or confused, something happens you know can't happen, and that's pure magic, a nice little miracle. Now, that was how the article ended, and let me now go just briefly. As, as I'm preparing to come up here, I was emptying my car, and I had some stuff, and I was getting ready for the trip, and I'm moving to my San Diego. And the act of leaving the car and heading to the room, our, our apartment in San Diego, something jabbed me in the left calf, and I started bleeding. I got up to the room. My girlfriend, Josie, is, oh, he's bleeding, he's bleeding. Oh, what's the problem? I don't know. I said, I'm, I'm out in the car. I'm OK. And I bring things into the room. And she <laughs> said, oh, she's panicky. She wants a Band-Aid on there immediately. And I don't you know it's blood. So she said, ah, I think I figured out what it was that you cut yourself on. And she shows me this hang file that says Jerry Andrews. And she thinks it's this. And I realize that's not sharp enough. And I look around for stuff and I realize what they cut me. It's one of Jerry's. This is this is metal. This is solid metal. That's a very sharp part of there. And I think we can take this as proof that there is no afterlife, because we know anybody on this planet that would never hurt anyone else is Jerry. Well, secular society and uh, the ergo is the rationality. And um, uh, he used to come to the uh, secular society meeting pretty regularly every every, uh, every month. And uh, he would always come with a uh, pocket full of optical illusions. And he carried these portable illusions with him. He pop these things, <coughs> these things are on the table right here. And invariably, he'd say, uh, Can I show you something? And, have some sort of illusion to show to the group. Well, the group, the, this is a pretty applicable group, and um, we end up talking at CSS, we'll talk about stuff all over the map. Well, Jerry doesn't have that kind of money. Jerry is a very focused individual, and so uh, when the subject would get a little off topic, he would uh, start looking at the floor and he'd shift into his chair and speed the stuff a little bit. And, and the next thing you know, he, he, he'd want to bring it back into the fold, and he'd say, Can I read you something? So he can bring something like this in school. Perhaps, perhaps the world was born by design or by chance, or some matter beyond the illusions of man. Perhaps the world was born by chance in a universe of chance, and one day atom made atom and made atom. Perhaps the world was born that one day man would spread his seed throughout the universe. Or perhaps the world and man were born to supplicate themselves before a God who needed his omnipotent vanity. Be that as it may, no matter how the world was born, you are here, you and me, we can walk in the gardens of the earth and look to the spark of the dawn. We can fly in the sky. And under the sea, and we can dream any dream within the vision of man. Thus, as we dream the visions of man, we can surely make some of them that are good come true. But for those of you who know Jerry really well, you know that he often invoked the word wonder, and uh, it was part of his vocabulary. Um, it was true that he was really seized with an insatiable wonder of being a human being, but all that really underpinned his overall philosophy. Um, he, he liked to use magic to illustrate the point that we have a wonderful human mind. And he was on a mission to help people understand how their minds and their perception worked. 
And, and how was it that he was fooled? He found a lot of freedom in the use of reason and was perplexed by people who could not or would not use their minds. As he would say, can I read something to you? Barriers to reason. Some of us do indeed have hidden in mind that which others would consider barriers to reason. Frequently unknown to us, they may have been built to shield us from the truth that we would not wish to accept. But it is not always easy to see them, but look, we should, so that we can hopefully offer, operate with reason, not with self interest. Jerry recognized that a lazy mind was a mind that's easy to deceive, but that our minds can also be deceived by design. And so he created this remarkable sleight of hand and these amazing optical illusions to show us that we can be fooled because we are knowledgeable and perceptive. I got to know him over the last year when I started working on this documentary project with him. And all the things, um, he really wanted his free verse to live beyond. And he spent a lot of time doing that. And he was writing up until the very last. Again, let me read something to you from Jeremy. It's there. The darkness is there that we might seek the sun. The hunger is there that we would seek the food. Knowledge is there that we might seek his wisdom, and time is there that we might use it. Now, a student of uh, English composition, a literary critic, uh, Jerry Andrews, was not. So sometimes in the course of filming and reading some of these things, I would ask him, well, what does this mean, Jerry? And he would say, well, the one I just read, he said, well, if there was darkness, you know, if you bellyache about the darkness, uh, you wouldn't have the dawn. So you can't appreciate one way or the other. <coughs> His poems are what they are. They say what he means. It came from, from his heart. Again, something from Jerry Andrews. Particles and spin. We may think that we think with reason. We actually, we think the particles that spin in the mind of man. They balance the ricochet and jump the synapses and decisions are made. If this engine of the mind is indeed powered by chaos, where lies the authority that makes this decision that? What is the me inside? Is it a product of the random ricochets? When the atoms dance that frantic dance of chaos as they jump from synapse to that? Does man really fit into the scheme of things, or is he just a microscopic speck in the story of the stars? These are thoughts that the great philosophers have pondered. But Jerry appreciated that he had the advantage of living in a time of scientific knowledge that was expanding like a supernova. He once had an MRI done while he was being diagnosed, and he was amazed human mind could conceive and build that machine. He even wrote a poem that. When I approached him about doing a documentary on him, he, he imposed no restrictions, no, no conditions. He didn't ask me if I had done any previous work. He didn't tell me how he wanted his story to be told. This man allowed free creative license. He understood the concept of Creativity. We started building back in May of 2006. And just mentioning the name Jerry Hammond's doors open. We were allowed unprecedented access to uh, the Magic Castle in Hollywood. And we filmed what was probably Jerry's final act. It was. It was Jerry's final act at the Magic Castle. In between shots um, of his act, uh, he would get out uh, between it between us, and uh, he would mingle with people in the audience, and he would usually corner some visitor to the Magic Castle. 
he noticed most often it was a very attractive woman. <laughs> and he would read his free verse. Um, we were barely a month into the, into the project when we, and we needed to uh, come up with a name for this thing. And we, we thought about, well, is he a Renaissance man? Um, that didn't fit Jerry. Uh, we, were, we were talking about a guy who has um, a remarkably wonderful, gentle man, uh, an amazing mind, and this unique, uh, magical talent. The film title itself, and was the man, the mind, the magic. But during the shooting one day, in his house, um, he asked if we could stop for a minute because he was sipping some apple juice out of the temple that he and his brother George had made from the apples in their yard. And he wanted to take a few moments just to appreciate the experience of this sweet, wonderful thing he and his brother had put together the taste of this apple juice. He appreciated it every moment in life. And then he said, if I die tomorrow, I will live a wonderful life. <laughs> I'm going to read one final thing, one of my favorite poems, and I'm going to show you just a few minutes from um, the documentary by my co-producer, Tyson Smith. Tyson, raise your hand if you're here today. Um, this is one of my favorite poems I'm going to show you. If you think it's only man who speaks, sit for a time on the bank of the whispering lake. Cast your eyes to the shadows that fall and hear the whisper of their enticement. And the breeze that stirs and moves them, feel the sound of its touch as it brushes your face. If you truly listen, you may even hear the landing of a leaf that fell. Sit and listen, and you may see that the soft whispers of nature sometimes speak louder than the words. Eighty-five years ago it was when I came from my mother's room to the library of the world. In that I didn't actually as such. I saw the bright lights, the huge creatures, and I sprawled. Glad I am that only at first did I sprawl, but soon my little eyes were seeing into the wonder of that new world. Surely did I not appreciate it at the time, but indeed they did not soak into the body Child. It's soaked inside and then the fires of hunger. The fires of hunger that burn in the day, even brighter. Even brighter. Mm -hmm. Who is Jerry then? Jerry is a, kind of a combination of uh, Albert Einstein and Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. Push them together, shake it up. And yet somebody that enjoys life, that enjoys relating to people, and enjoys sharing a, a wonderful experience with people. In a very clever and challenging way. In, in, in a true sense, where he's a real wizard. He engages the mind and the spirit and uplifts the mother. That's what you're I do not normally tell lies. I mean, in my life. And I would like to take somebody's life or something like that. But other than that, and it is extremely difficult for me many times. But the reason for it is that, for one reason, people who know me, if I've said something and somebody said, I think he was lying, that, that people who know me said, no, that, that wouldn't be Jerry Anders. And uh, like I said, it's put me in an awkward position many times. Uh, but, uh, Again, people who know me, if they ask me something and I tell them that they, they, they know I'm not lying, which is important. And I agree that, that, uh, that lots of times 
if you jump something to the truth, you might say it's even cool. <coughs> the world would be better off if we didn't lie, I think. I was a draft in World War II. I spent four years and one day in the Army. When I was being inducted, uh, uh, we went into a room we had nothing on but a slip of paper and hand to the guy and he looked at your ears or something going to the next one and looked at something else and had a little money in it. This guy said, behind the desk, I handed him a slip and he said, what do you think of military training? And I said, well, I can't think of anything that did worse. It's a necessary evil, but, but uh, and uh, what uh, you know, conscience you take there? I said, no. And uh, we discussed a little, and I finally said, look, I'll go over there and fight the Japanese and Germans. But neither you nor anybody else will ever make me hate them. So I wrote something on my slip and handed it to me. Well, I read it going into the next booth and said, that to be maladjusted because of certain state of beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I 
really worried anymore. I don't think there's much exercise on the treadmill as I'm sure. Carrie, I met my home in Brunson, New Jersey, 20 some years ago when I lived uh, in uh, the Northern States. And uh, we were sitting there, I guess, having lunch or whatever, and I had a stuckle wall there beside me. And suddenly Jerry looks up at the wall and he picks up a business card off the table. And there's a Danny Longlands there, okay? Walking across the wall. And he simply put the card in front of the Danny Longlands, who probably walks up in the car. And he says, Oh, excuse me. And he goes to the front door of the wall, middle of the summer. He opens the door, and I follow him inside and says, He's curious, what is Jerry Atkins going to do with a Danny Longlands? Takes him. They, they carry him back, puts on the wall. The Danny Longlands walks off onto the wall, and Jerry says to him, He addresses this little beast. And he says, you're much better off out here because you are a creature of nature and you belong in the outdoors. And this is where you make your living and uh, we hope you have a happy life. back inside of me. I sat down for a sip of my coffee and straight in the eyes and said, Terry, you spoke to the spider. He said, yes. I said, the spider, understand you? He said, oh, I'm not sure not, but I don't know that it did.
What a glory to worship him forever in the world of absolute perfection. Well, he's a very ethical person to him. Um, uh, in the international scene, he doesn't things that captured Jerry's view of himself, actually. Uh, in 1978, Jerry actually decided to try that he quit his job. 1971, and he quit his job, and he was, I know he was 53 years old when he quit his job, and uh, he decided maybe he would try to make a living as a professional magician. He never did, but he did make a brochure in 1978, this is his brochure, mm -hmm. but in it, he ca captures, I think, a lot of what Jeff <laughs> For example, the major title of the thing is Jerry Andrus, a most unique, and this is a self description, and truly honest master of deceit. Then he gives some quotes, his favorite quotes, about himself by other magicians, well known magicians. So the great Blackstone said, they compliment you on the best close-up magic I have ever seen. Dave Vernon, by the way, I knew Dave Vernon when he was Di, uh, Di Vernon, and then he became Dave Vernon, and kept changing that, and then on which coast he did. <laughs> but on the East Coast, I knew him as Dave Vernon, and on the West Coast, he became Di Vernon. But anyways, he considered one of the deans, one of the great magicians, among magicians, of all time, long-time resident of the Magic Castle, uh, he said, quote, I have been thinking of every superlative I am acquainted with and find them entirely inadequate to describe many revolutionary ideas incorporated in the magic of Jerry Andrews. He quotes me here too, but uh, mm -hmm. I must skip that. <laughs> Martin Gardner, while you know the name or not, if you don't know Martin Gardner, you should. Anyway, Martin Gardner said, quote, never have I watched a close-up magician who more consistently and completely knocked me over. Jerry Andrus is an original. His methods are utterly unlike those of other magicians in their often subtleties, their crazy but clean moves, and their total absence of any need for misdirection. His effects have to be seen do not be believed. Uh, we've got some others here, but I just wanted to quote one because you just saw an example of his color change. That's, that's what it was called, that, that the beat did so well. Uh, and Charlie Miller, who's a legend among magicians who know, are heavy into cards. Charlie Miller originally was, a, he was living by being a professional gambler. Apparently, didn't meet Jerry's standards about the way he uh, made it. Really <laughs> but still, they did admire one another. Charlie Miller said, uh, speaking of Jerry's color change, that is the most beautiful move in magic. So the country meant something. Now, I thought I'd just give another quote. As I said, Jerry, I have this letter. I have a copy of this letter. Jerry's always had a copy of it. <laughs> so I have a copy of this. Letter he wrote uh, to 1971. So that's funny. He wrote a letter to Mr. Dewey Wolverjack, assistant business manager, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 659, etc. Uh, the letter is, of course, a letter. It's uh, single space, three pages. <laughs> Typical Jerry. Basically, as someone already said, I think it's basically, he um, uh, was leaving, quitting the, this is that he was quitting the, resigning his membership in the union, which he had been a member of since he was age 17. He first joined the veteran when he was age 17, and uh, now he's resigning at age uh, 51. And he was resigning because uh, the way he worked it out, he tells, explains it here, that Every time the manager comes around and tells him how to do something so as to do less work 
to get more money. Uh, he worked it out that pretty soon they would be doing no work and getting a huge amount of money. <laughs> and he thought that was unethical and unfair. On the other hand, he also saw many things that were unfair about the owner, the owners, the management. And I just want to read you one quick paragraph. He's talking about why he is not going to have any more to do with the union or the management. Well, the name Jerry Andrus is an honorable one, internationally so. This is the reason I no longer want him associated with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Sometimes it is better to be a hungry man with honor than a hypocrite with a full belly. Therefore, in spite of my 23 years of yardy with the company, I have asked the superintendent of the Air Construction Company to leave me at my job as soon as he can have it replaced me. And the red head was on in that vein. I just want to give you another idea of how Jerry saw him. It was very, very important to him to be a man of honor. Uh, Some has asked me to um, tell the story. I wrote a story. I first met Jerry I mean, uh, in 1956. He had just written his book called Jerry, uh, Andrews Deals in Man, a classic which has been fortunately re reproduced with Jerry's permission and is now on sale by Chas Roach. Chas Company sells magic company also sells about eight or nine of Jerry's items with Jerry's with approval. And now the income that comes from it will go to Jerry's estate, which is uh, George, actually. And, but anyway, uh, I, uh, uh, when I first met him in 56, was at an Angie convention in Hartford, Connecticut. It was the second convention Jerry ever attended. Uh, and uh, at that time, in those days, there were two uh, groups of magicians who thought they were the center of the world of magic, especially card magic. There were people from New York. At that time, Dave Vernon, who I quoted uh, about Jerry, was living in New York, and his people around him thought they were the greatest card magicians in the world. Anyone else didn't happen. The people in Chicago, under another group, Ed Marlowe, thought they were the wrong people on the card magic. And at conventions like the one in Hartford, would be a card table at the convention. And all the people who attended to the card magic didn't attend any, any part of the rest of the convention. They would sit almost 24 hours a day in this card room, along one side of the table, all the <coughs> Chicago, the other side came all the people from New York, and all the rest of us, more neither from New York or Chicago, stood up and watched. <laughs> well, the cards were going around the table, and each the Chicago guy would try to do something to impress the New York people, and vice versa. And suddenly, there's a guy sitting at the table, and he was a happy to be on the Chicago side. And uh, his name was Jerry Andrews, of course. He stood up, and they went, Look, who is this guy? He's not one of us. What kind of a nerve does he have to get up here and do something? Uh, you know, among us. And Jerry began with what they thought, and I thought, what we thought was what's called the swap shuffle, sometimes called the drunken shuffle. It goes something like this. In the middle of your routine, you talk about a drunk and took the cards away from you and begin mixing in a very funny way. Some face up, some face down, some face up, some face down, and so on. Uh, and by the end of the end of the mix up, would actually, the magician know this, you end up with half the cards facing one way and the other cards facing the other way. And to get them to face all the other way secretly, you have to do what's called a half ass. And it was a big fight at that time among magicians, still is a little bit, whether someone could do a half ass without, you know, secret, invisible. It's very difficult to do because you've got to turn half the deck over. And if you do it right, uh, you get them to face our face the same way. But people can see. It. Something. And it was a question whether you could do it invisibly. Well, Jerry comes out there and he starts to do what they all felt was the uh, uh, this, is okay. this, is okay. this is how Jerry is able to do it. But he stood up and he did, and they all groaned. He said, Oh, he's doing the old swap shuffle. And he did this, and he did this, and he did this, and he did this. And when Jerry's method, he ends up only with one card facing down. 
the wrong way. All the other Catholics do face the same thing. Okay? Uh, but we all thought, including I was there, and I guess that I was around. And Jerry has a way I won't go into of turning this kind of a secret. He's doing this now. They all burn his hands, as we say in magic. They all watch him. How is he going to do that half pass? This is going to be the test, but he's a great magician. And so the room full of magicians, the top magicians and the top magicians, were watching Jerry's hands. Jerry stood there and did nothing. On the table, he spread it out, all facing the same way. <laughs> and finally, uh, one guy uh, at, at, sitting opposite with Jerry said to the man sitting at the head table, I won't mention his name because he's a very famous magician still. So he said, Harry, did you see? <laughs> <laughs> Harry, did you see his pass? Now, Harry is a New Yorker. And I don't think people know New Yorkers, but no New York ever gives anyone credit. <laughs> this is an almost a, a, a basic built into it, I guess. Uh, and Harry said, in a sneering way, as typical New Yorkers are, they like to sneer, right? And Harry said, he didn't do the pass. I saw what he did. He switched the decks. <laughs> <laughs> and we all laughed for a while, but then the dawn on us, switching the decks was even more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, someone said, oh, Harry, he did the pass. I saw him do it, but he did it very well. <laughs> of course, but Jerry, of course, had done nothing, obviously. And it's a nice story about, it fits Jerry's philosophy, because in Jerry's mind, you know, that uh, we all can be had under the right conditions, and we're not going to admit it. And, uh, well, anyway, that's another story. You. What was his view of death? I am John Deere, president of Corvallis Secular Society. Our newsletter's tagline is, Corvallis Secular Society is a humanist and free thought society for all non-theists of your world. Jerry attended our first meeting in June 1994 and was a member continuously until his death. I quickly discovered that Jerry was a humanist. Humanism <coughs> is a worldview free from beliefs in the supernatural and paranormal. Jerry felt that the existence of one or more gods was extremely improbable. Yet he called himself an agnostic rather than an atheist to emphasize that he could not claim with absolute certainty that no God of any sort of kind exists. Like all humans, Jerry was dedicated to the use of free inquiry, critical intelligence, reason, and scientific method in acquiring all knowledge and in providing meaning and values for individuals. Truly, Jerry was kind to all he met and anyone could talk to him. His fame never affected his humility. In Corral's Sacred Society September newsletter I wrote, Diogenes the Cynic wandered about ancient Greece carrying a lantern and searching for an honest man. He could have visited Jerry. The search would have been over. <laughs> Jerry would never tell a lie. Not even on stage. He wouldn't say the coin disappears. He would instead say, the coin appears to vanish, for the coin is no longer in my hand. Jerry's view of death was a humanistic point. He lived life to the fullest and never valued it the less, because he knew his life, like all life, would come to an end. After having known Jerry for 13 years, and having discussed our mutual naturalistic philosophy with him many times, I believe that Jerry's view of life and death are well expressed by the following. A quote from Bertrand Russell, British mathematician, philosopher. An individual human existence should be like a river, small at first, narrowly contained within its banks, and rushing passionately past boulders and over waterfalls. Gradually, the river goes quiet. The banks recede, the waters flow more slowly. And in the end, without a visible break, they become merged in the sea and painlessly lose their individual being. The man or woman who in old age can see his or her life in this way will not suffer from the fear of death, since the things they care about will continue. I should wish to die while still at work, knowing that others will carry on what I can no longer do, and contend in the thought 
that what was possible has been done. The long, productive life of Jerry Andrews has come to its end. And we My name is David Saltman, and uh, I have the great good fortune to know Jerry for more than 20 years. I'm one of those New Yorkers that uh, Ray mentioned. Um, <laughs> but we do give credit, because credit is due, and it certainly is due in his case. In fact, I've been asked by a number of New York magicians, including Mark Minton and Johnny Fox, to uh, convey their regrets that they couldn't be here today, but to send their love. And their love that goes is to George also. Um, I also had the great good fortune during those 20 years to follow Jerry around with the camera. And uh, I, I'm also making a film about him. And um, during that, uh, the, one of our great adventures together, Ray was there, Scott Morris was there, uh, happened in the uh, late 80s where we were uh, out to expose the Oregon Vortex. Uh, you may have heard about this, it's one of Jerry's favorite, uh, favorite adventures too. And during the course of this, uh, uh, Really, adventure is the only word for it. We discussed all kinds of uh, uh, philosophy and uh, ideas. And the main question that we were trying to answer, and this was sort of the essence of the Oregon Vortex uh, episode, was, and I asked this to Jerry point blank on camera, I said, Jerry, if you saw a genuine miracle, how would you know? And he really thought about that. He said, you know, he said, I don't know. He said, that's a good question. How would you really be able to tell if something was a genuine psychic phenomenon or paranormal event? Uh, maybe it's not so easy. And we were talking about this. We were in somebody's motel room, I believe. And I think Ray turned on, the, had the television on or something like that. And during the course of this conversation, we happened to, we all kind of stopped and we started watching the television because on there was the world's champion baton twirl. Do you remember this? And this was a girl who was unbelievable. She was taking that baton, she was throwing it up in the air, and it was whirling a million times, she didn't catch it behind her back, throw it again, throw two batons. And we were all looking at that, and Jerry said, God, he said, just imagine how many hundreds of thousands of times she's thrown that baton and it hit her on the head, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, but he said, at some point, something happened. She achieved inside some kind of a critical mass, and suddenly, Magic. And that really made us all think. And uh, later on that day, I had noticed that Jerry was kind of off by himself, as he would sometimes do. And he, he was going like this. And he was talking to himself. And I kind of sneaked up on him, because filmmakers think they have the right to sneak up on anyone. <laughs> a microphone in their face. I, I, I kind of sneaked up on him. I wanted to hear what he was saying. He was looking at his hand. And he said, You know, that's a genuine miracle. <laughs> I'm president of the Oregon Local Skeptics Group. Jerry was one of our founding members. Had a lot of things to say about Jerry, but everyone's done a wonderful job. We know that he was a very kind and very dignified man, and George and Jerry are just the most amazing, wonderful people. Uh, we interacted with Jerry primarily showing his optical illusions at Cordell's uh, Da Vinci Day Festival, high school, science fairs, other events for youth. And it was tremendously fun to interact with Jerry in that uh, very creative way. And it was uh, just, just an honor to do it. But he is a very dignified and very kind uh, person. A couple of comments. We are working to preserve Jerry's life work. We have a Friends of Jerry Andrews nonprofit in the works. There will be a memorial fund that will then be used to go to preserve and promote uh, his, his work and his life and preserve many of the things that he's invented and done that would, would be perhaps beyond the magic. And so if you would like to donate your cards, there's a box out front by the guest book. If you forgot or got past the guest book also, <coughs> be sure to sign the guest book before you leave. One comment, I've been helping, I live local, so I have the privilege of seeing Jerry fairly regularly. 
and especially recently with his illness, uh, he was creative and lucid up until the last few days. Very funny, very upbeat about his impending death. And, and I know he kind of mentioned this on part of the video clip, but we were talking to him one day, and somebody said, well, Jerry, we don't want you to kick the bucket in prematurely. And he goes, listen to what you're saying prematurely. I'm 89 years old. It's too late for me to die prematurely. <laughs> His sense of humor remained, and his, his creative, active mind remained creative to the end. There In keeping with Jerry's beliefs, uh, Dwight Vance has written a very special Broken Wand ceremony just for the celebration. After the Broken Wand ceremony, there will be some magicians and some real people. Uh, <laughs> You know, that's true. So Jerry's magic and off the loop in an outside area. We'll also be able to enjoy pizza, which is provided by George. So please thank George or through George's contact. Please thank George for the pizza. And uh, we read there are two international organizations that have broken lawn ceremonies, and we read those, and I said I couldn't read that with a straight face. And Jerry hated it. So I did a generic rewrote, he came up with a generic version of the Rope Milan ceremony, and he approved of it. That's the reason we're using it today. So he hated the other one. <laughs> I didn't know who was going to do this, and I said, if somebody's going to do the real thing, I will leave. Otherwise, I'll be sitting here snickering, and I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm going to be dishonoring Jerry, I guess. He did, he did approve that. Uh, for many years, Jerry's been an active person in magic organizations. He helped co-found the magicians, the mysticians, rather, in Eugene. Uh, all the magic clubs are members of the Pacific Coast Association of Magicians, so we have to remember that. Uh, the Portland Society of Magicians is an independent club, and he belonged to that, and that's right, there's been long time ago, and uh, the two international organizations are the Society of American Magicians, they have an assembly in Portland, and the International Brotherhood of Magicians, and they have a, a ring here, and uh, we he helped out with the monster, and we like Michael Roth, who is the uh, president of the SM Center. I'm going to read it. He's going to break the law when the time comes. I'll go. <laughs> you have to hold it up. I'm not going to go like this. It's going to be over. I'm not rehearsing so much. In remembrance of Jerry Andrews, we participate humbly in the service that we may offer an appropriate and heartfelt tribute. Followers of the magic art throughout the world will bow their heads in this moment in spirit to pay him honor. Drawn close to each other by this, in this life, by our interest in the mysteries of magic, we join his family, Lord, in the knowledge that none are dead who live in the hearts they leave behind. Worldwide symbols of magic, or the pattern of rings, link firmly derived from a feature of conjuring known in all countries beneath the sun. In the steel of these rings is an emblemized the strength the ties which bind together the followers to this honor and art, much like the Olympic rings. Sport. In their being linked one to another, we observe that unity, which regardless of race, creed, or color, hold people of high purpose in bonds of everlasting fellowship. And the deathless illusion which employs these rings is symbolized the timelessness which overarches the years with no brothers, no brothers ever forgotten were lost to a call by the supreme magician to another state. As a member of the Brotherhood, our friend was one link, one ring in the great chain which circles the earth, yet his ring remains ever with us for a part of his immortality. Since time immemorial, the wand, 
has been the symbol of power. Channel one, side one. Copy number two of a storage tape for electric organ ideas. Track one. This is the beginning of channel one, side one. A copy of a storage tape for electric organ ideas. Various dates. This one was 18th of October, 1968. Same day, Albany.
November 1967, Albany. I'm experimenting with some more rhythms on the organ. Some of this is about like I had before, but there's some variation here. I have the foot pedals coupled to the bass, and the swell manual is on bass, clarinet, uh, violin, flute eight, and quint on repeat, and on swell red, and on great to swell. It's on organ reverb, and the great manual is on diapson, saxophone, and cello, and on pedal sustain.